Greetings everybody and today we're going to be deriving some contour integral representations for the binomial coefficients which are these gentlemen over here the entries k's so this is actually something pretty cool you can do you can use it to derive some nice identities involving these coefficients and calculate infinite sums as well using the residue theorem uh, we'll probably get to that in the next video just as a little example um, but today we're just going to focus on the integral representations um, and you probably would have seen it already in the thumbnail and we could just go ahead and verify them, but verifying things is a bit boring. Um, so I think it's a bit more fun if we try to rederive everything on our own from scratch. So how do we get started? Well, let's just start off with the contour integral over some, I guess, simple closed curve C of some complex function f of z, which will probably depend on n and k as well, integrated with respect to z. And the idea is we want n choose k to be equal to this contour integral in a way. And we're trying to find what this function f of z could be. Now, how do we normally evaluate contour integrals? Well, assuming we can use Cauchy's residue theorem, this whole entire thing is equal to 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of your function. Now, two things over here. We have this 2 pi i factor at the front. Now to avoid carrying this factor around everywhere uh, when we try to find what f of z could be, I'm just going to divide it off straight away. Um, and if our residues end up becoming real, um, well, that's a good thing because our binomial coefficients are also real. Um, so that's out of the way. Another thing to notice is well, what is the expression for n choose k? It's just a bunch of things multiplied together. There's no additions or anything, which means ideally we only want this to be one residue. We only want to evaluate one residue, not the sum of residues. Um, so let's keep that in mind. So what this turns out to be so far is just the residue at some points of your function f of z. Now, what points could this be? Well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we could just choose anything. And if we're not satisfied with it, we could just do a translation or something in the complex plane. Um, but just to keep things simple, let's just um, assume the residue is at zero, which means we want our function f of z to have a pole at z equals zero or the origin. Okay, so where do we go from here? here well how do we calculate the residues well we can just use the formula for residues and so on um, we don't know what the order of the pole is so let's just use the generalized formula for residues at high order poles so if we assume this is say for instance an mth order pole then the formula for an mth order pole is one over the order minus one factorial then we have the limit as z approaches the pole, which is zero, of the derivative of n minus one order with respect to z of your function, but you're also going to multiply by z minus the pole, which is zero, so z minus zero, which is z, raised to the order of the pole, which is m, times your function f of z. So this is a formula you could memorize or you could just watch my video on high order poles. I'll probably link it in the description. So this is the formula that we're working with. Um, so we choose an mth order pole because we don't know what the pole could be or what the order of the pole could be. Now, just taking a look at this right hand side with what we want it to be, which is n choose k or this n factorial over k factorial n minus k factorial. We already see some similarities. Namely, we have some factorial action going on in the denominator. And nicely, there's also factorials down here as well. So what we could do is set, for instance, m minus one to be equal to k or n minus k. Now, it actually doesn't matter which one we choose because of the following property of these binomial coefficients, which is that n choose k is the exact same thing as n choose n minus k. So this is a nice symmetry property. Um, so if you pick k, you could get to the other cases by applying this symmetry property. Um, but yeah, just to keep things simple, we'll just choose k. So we could set, for instance, our n minus 1 over here to be equal to k. Now, if we do this, what are we going to get? Well, we're going to get 1 over m minus 1 becomes k, and then we have a factorial. 
then we have the limit as z approaches zero of the derivative. Now this is going to be a kth order derivative because k is m minus one with respect to z of z to the m, but m now becomes k plus one times f of z. So this is what we have. So we have this nice factorial which matches up over here. Now what we wanna do now is try to figure out some, or try to find some function f of z, such, when, such that once we take the derivative and also multiply by z to the k plus one and take the limit, it evaluates to whatever is remaining, which is n factorial over n minus k factorial. Um, now just to simplify things a little bit, I guess we can let some new function a g of z to be equal to z to the k plus one or um, times f of z just so instead of worrying about two functions we can just worry about finding what g of z is and once we find what g of z is we can find what f of z is quite easily so this now becomes one over k factorial and then we have the limit as z approaches zero of the derivative k or the derivative of g of z Okay, so this is what we have. And as I said before, we want this part over here to be equal to n factorial over n minus k factorial. So let's write that down. What do we want on our wish list? Um, we want the limit as z approaches zero of the kth order derivative with respect to z of g of z to be equal to n factorial over n minus k factorial. Now, what I'm going to do as well is I'm going to expand this out a little bit. This is n, then we have n minus one dot dot dot, and we'll probably get to n minus k plus one, and then we'll get to n minus k, and then going all the way down to one. And on the denominator, what would that be? Well, that's just going to be n minus k, and then we'll multiply all the way down until one. And the nice thing is some things will cancel, so n minus k and n minus k cancel and basically yeah, everything down until one will cancel and that's going to leave us with n n minus one and then all the way down until n minus k plus one all right so this is basically some number n and we multiply by successive integers um, going downwards towards n minus k plus one Okay, so this is what we have, and notice as well, what do we want? We want the kth derivative with respect to z of some function g, which means we're taking the derivative k times. And hopefully you guys can think of some kind of function which that, such that when you take the derivative k times, you get something of this nature. Um, a good guess would be, so we can guess now, uh, maybe g of z could be something raised to the nth power. So for example, z raised to the nth power. Um, because notice, if you take the first derivative of z, you get to this n. If you take the second derivative, you get to n minus one. And if you do that k times, well, you'll pick up this final factor of n minus k plus one. So this is the zeroth derivative, I guess. And if you keep going until the kth derivative, with respect to z. Um, this is going to give you, well, we have n and then n minus one, and then all the way down, you do this k times, so you will only get up to n minus k plus one, and then you have z, and um, this should be n minus k, like so. Okay, so the derivative, kth, uh, kth order derivative of g of z will produce you this expression. Now we also wanna take the limit as z approaches zero. The problem is if you take the limit, this is gonna become zero and the whole thing vanishes. So we need to, in order to keep these factors alive, we need to translate our z a little bit. Um, why not just, instead of having just a z, let's have one plus a z. And that should fix all the issues. So if we have one plus a z raised to the n minus k over here and take the limit as z approaches zero, then we recover these factors, which is really quite nice. So this is one possible candidate for our function g of z. Um, now another possible one as well that I'll derive as well in this video, we could guess, I guess this is guess number two now, is you could 
have a g of z. Now notice we have positive powers over here, but you could also guess negative powers. So why not guess something like one plus z raised to the minus n. Um, now you could do this, the only problem is if you differentiate k times, um, this power of n, its, its order or its magnitude, it's only going to increase, it's not going to decrease like we had over here. So if you kind of imagine a number line, um, it's also raining outside right now, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, don't know if you guys can hear the rain or not. Um, hopefully it doesn't get too loud. But if you imagine for the positive case over here, we started at some number n, then we just kept multiplying down, and then we get n minus one, dot, 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 and then n minus k plus one. Okay, now if we flip everything over here, make everything a negative, and assume we start at n again, then notice, or minus n instead, notice that if we differentiate, the magnitude of this will only increase, it won't decrease. So this would be something like minus n plus one, and then minus n plus two, and so on. We won't be going downwards. So instead of starting at n, which is the first factor over here, let's start at the very final factor. That way we can get all these factors once we, if we keep walking downwards. Um, so the idea is, instead of starting for the negative case, instead of starting at n, we're going to start at n minus k plus one, um, with the negative, of course. And the next power would be minus n minus k, and then we have a plus two. And then we're gonna keep on going, and then we're going to finally, finally reach, for example, minus n, this would be minus one. And then this final guy over here, that would be minus n. So these are all the factors or the powers, which will eventually be factors, I guess, that we want. Um, now, the only problem with doing this is that we pick up an extra negative factor every single time we differentiate. Um, so that's just going to alternate the plus or minus every time, which is not too great. Now, a way to fix this is instead of having one plus z over here, let's just put one minus z. So by the chain rule, each time we differentiate, we also pick up um, an extra negative sign, which cancels out the negative sign from bringing the power down. Um, and yeah, of course we can't start at n, as mentioned before, we have to start at n minus k plus one. So if you differentiate this guy, um, k times, so this is the zeroth derivative, and then if you go up to the kth derivative here, then what this becomes, we don't have to worry about negatives or anything because those are already taken care of. We have n minus k plus one, and then we have what's next on the list, it's n minus k plus two. Then we walk upwards up until n minus one and then n. And then we also have to multiply by z, or oh, it's one minus z, raised to the, I think that would become minus n if we differentiate k times. Um, so yeah, this is what we have now we're going to take the limits as well. And if you take the limit, the z will disappear and one raised to anything is um, one. So we've recovered all these nice factors that we wanted. So we have two possible candidates for g of z. Um, we have this positive guy over here or this negative guy. Um, and once we have our functions g of z, well, we can just figure out what f of z would be quite easily. So. These are, I guess, I guess, two different g of z, so I call the second one maybe g twiddle over here. So this would be g, g twiddle k. So finally, our functions f of z, what are they? They are going to be, well, how do we get f of z? We just take g of z and divide by z to the k plus one. So the first one would be one plus z to the n over z to the k plus one. And then the second one, let's say f twiddle, is going to be equal to we have, where is it? It's one minus z. Now, since there's a negative power over here, um, let's bring it onto the denominator. So we have one minus z to the n minus k plus one. Then we divide it by z to the k plus one down here as well. Okay, so these are our functions f of z. Um, now, just to make things match up with Wikipedia a little bit, I'm going to modify the second one a little bit. Um, this has to do with the fact that 
n choose k. I think I mentioned this before. Is equal to n choose n minus k. So we can replace k with n minus k and nothing will change. So I guess we'll introduce another function over here. Let's call it f twiddle twiddle um, of z. And that's going to be equal to one over. Um, if we replace k with n minus k, then the bottom we should have one minus z raised to the, that would be k plus one. And then the second factor that would be z, k turns into n minus k and then plus one. So f twiddle and f twiddle twiddle, those are two completely different functions. But once, the idea is once we plug it back into this integral, um, well, the final value will be the same because of this symmetry property of the binomial coefficients. Um, so yeah, we're basically done now. Let's see where I should put this. Let's just throw it in over here. We can write, finally write down the contour integral representations for n choose k. So the first one, n choose k, that's equal to, well, we had the one over two pi i from the very start. And then we have the contour integral over c of our function, which we found to be but the first one is one plus a z to the n over z to the k plus one dz. And the second one, that's n choose k, that's equal to one over two pi i. And then contour in school over c of f twiddle twiddle, which happens to be one over one minus a z to the k plus one. And then we also have a z to the n minus k plus one dz. So these are the two contour integral representations I wanted to derive today. Um, you can check them out on Wikipedia as well. I think um, these are named after a guy called, I forgot his name, it started with an E. I think it was um, Agrashev or something like that. Don't know how to pronounce Russian names. Um, but yeah, you can check that out on Wikipedia. I'll probably link it in the description as well. And these are the two integral representations you'll find on there as well. Um, I guess Final thing to note is that, of course, your contour C has to enclose the pole at zero. So both of these functions have poles at zero. And um, this one has a K plus one order pole. This one has an N minus K plus one order pole. Um, the only caveat is that the second one, so for the first one, you could choose literally any loop that goes around it. For the second one, you actually get two poles because of this one minus Z as well. You get a pole at Z equals zero and you get a pole at z equals one. So you have to be a bit careful. Um, you don't want to enclose both of the poles because then you'll evaluate two residues. You only want to choose um, your contour such that it encloses the pole at zero. So you could choose anything as long as it doesn't enclose the pole at one. Um, so that's for the second one. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And in the next one, I'll probably have um, an application of this with an infinite sum. So up until then, hope you guys have a wonderful day and I'll see everyone in the next one. Bye bye.